Um, yeah, that line, uh, belonging, where do we belong? <laughs> it's an easy, uh, easy question. Well, I think I come from a long line of not belonging because my mother was from a very rough working class estate in Kent in the UK and she never felt part of her family. She was very ambitious, she was very intelligent, she became a writer and an artist. And um, her family, basically, as soon as she was old enough to go out to work, she took elocution lessons. She used to make her own clothes from Vogue patterns. Her family accused her of putting on airs. And when the war came, she wanted to get out of Britain after the war, because it was very dreary. My father was from a village near the Nepalese border in UP, a village called Nanpara. He was a Kayasta, so his grandfather was a police chief. His father worked in the post office and became the postmaster, and his uncle was a court clerk in Lucknow. And my father, again, never felt part of his family. He was an only child. His mother died very soon after he was born. And he um, basically, although Kyostas at that time didn't do this, he joined the Navy because he wanted to go abroad. So he ended up in the UK during the war, which is where my parents met in 1948. So I'm really a product of colonialism. If my parents hadn't met as a result of the war, I wouldn't exist. Um, and then, of course, as children of a mixed, you know, mixed race marriage, we had our own sense of unbelonging because we were what were then called half-castes in India. And I can remember as a small child at school that none of the Hindu girls wanted to sit next to me, that at lunchtime um, I would always hang out with the, maybe the one Muslim girl in class, the, the Parsi girl, the Anglo-Indian girl, the Christian South Indian girl. Um, so there was no choice about your friends. You just hung out with the other misfits. And I remember thinking when, I'd go, when I was going to go to England, when my mother decided to return to England after my parents got divorced, thinking maybe I'll fit in in England, you know. And um, I got to England in 1968, and it was um, the year that Enoch Powell made his Rivers of Blood speech about immigration, how if immigration continued, there would be rivers of blood flowing in the streets. Um, the Kenyans, you, um, Asians, had been just expelled from Uga um, Kenya that year. And I went to university in uh, Coventry, University of Warwick, where there were a lot of car factories, and a lot of the Asians went to Coventry to work in the car factories. And um, basically, there was a huge backlash against immigration. So it was a bit like out of the frying pan into the fire. And I think I've spent my entire life searching for a sense of belonging. But I'll stop there um, and let the others. Yeah, uh, so uh, before defining or analyzing what belonging means to me, I would like to first place myself in a position. And when I say uh, to place myself in a position, uh, I would like to place myself uh, in a social location that I come from. Uh, there are many identities that I carry along with me. I'm a student. I'm an Antika hip hop artist. I'm from Odisha. Uh, I'm a Dalit who was uh, converted to Christian. Uh, but these identities of being a student, being an artist, or being from Odisha are mutually exclusive. But there's one identity that has been always there with me since my childhood, to the university days, to the art spaces that I go to, or the writings that I do, and that is the Dalit identity. The identity of being stigmatized, the identity of being humiliated, the identity of being always otherized. And that happens at various levels. Uh, so in the village, uh, it's, very, um, it's, 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 uh, it's very evident that you're not allowed uh, public spaces, you're not allowed to drink, uh, you know, you're not allowed to have access to water resources, you're segregated. Uh, but when you come to university spaces, all of this happens in, at a very sophisticated level when, uh, you know, uh, it happens through uh, students socializing, in their own groups, own circles, because of certain interests, uh, which, which particularly belongs to a you know, certain class or a certain caste. Um, so, 
for this Dalit identity has been something that I have been carrying all along my life. So from that position, I would like to look at my belonging. Where do I belong? Uh, I look at my history. I look at my culture. I look at the occupation that uh, my ancestors have been carrying on for all these decades. I look at also the material realities that is around me. So when I look at my history, the history that, that is given to me is most of the times uh, it's about stigma, it's about subjugation, it's about exploitation. The culture that I have, uh, the culture that, that I have, you know, certain, let's say, uh, certain art form that my community. In Orissa, uh, we, there's an art form called uh, Gana Baja. You know, it's uh, basically performing in, during the funeral or during the wedding of the high caste people. Or Parai in Tamil Nadu, where uh, the Dalits used to perform the same for funeral and wedding. So a certain part of history, that has, a big part of history has been erased and distorted. So where do I find my belonging? Is how can I reinterpret my own history? There are, hist there are events in history where uh, we are not stigmatized. Like uh, the events in history were not subjugated. We have rebelled. Like uh, Mahar Satyagraha in 1927, where Ambedkar along with uh, many Dalits, uh, for the first time, takes a march for access to public water, like access to water and access to public spaces. Before that, you have the Battle of Bhima Koregaon, or you have Sabitri Bhai Phule opening up uh, schools for uh, women, uh, for uh, girl children. So this is where uh, the reinterpretation of history comes along. And, uh, but recently what has happened is, uh, there's this very famous director, movie director called Paranjit uh, from Tamil Nadu. So he made a point that before you, we used to perform uh, for the high caste people during a funeral or a wedding, but now we will perform for ourselves. So that's a rec reclamation of culture. So that is one part of my belonging. That is how I look, look at belonging. And uh, if anyone asks me, do you have a belonging? I don't think I have any. I think it's a process. It's always a conflict. And there's, another, there's, a, uh, there's a political aspect of it through which I try to um, ask what has been denied to us and deprived to us? Land, resources, education, and representation in all the socio-economic and cultural institutions, be it bureaucracy, judiciary, um, higher education institutions. Recently, there was uh, data that came out which said uh, in IITs, out of uh, you know, some 8,000 something faculties, hardly 0.003% uh, percentage of the faculties are from the Dalit community. If you look at the bureaucracy, you know, the joint secretaries, the cabinet secretaries at the higher level, you would hardly find any Dalits. So for me, my, I find my sense of belonging, I would like to find my sense of belonging in the future. It's a process and it will happen through reclaiming my culture for myself, reinterpreting the history and at the same time fight for the basic human dignity, my land, resources and representation in educational institutions and all other different kinds of institutions that is at present. Um, so for my experience with belonging, um, like you were saying, very much a process. I, I say that I belong to nowhere and I belong to everywhere um, at the same time. So it's a dual process. Uh, my family were refugees from Congo to the UK. And so from a young age, I knew living in London, growing up in London, I knew it wasn't my home. Um, my parents told me that Congo is home. Congo is where you belong. Um, so for a long time, when I was growing up, I was always thinking that when I went back to Congo, I would feel amongst my people. I would feel like I belong. And a part of me does feel that. But the first time that I went back, there was almost like a clash of this feeling. Because right now, we live in a global capitalist society and a lot of that glorifies materialism, excess wealth, individualism and a lot of that has seeped into uh, Congolese society, especially in the capital city. So when I went back expecting to get in touch with my culture and my roots and my origin, but then I saw my family members were watching Kim Kardashian and were, you know, following all the things, imitating all the things that happen in the West, for me, that's, I didn't feel like I belonged there. Um, and so it was a real challenge to come to terms with that. But 
I think for, for me, I say, why I say I belong to nowhere is because I don't believe in the idea of nations. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't believe in borders because Congo, for example, is a product of colonialism. And for Congo to exist as a nation, it was be because it was colonized by Belgium. We have DRC, DR Congo, and we have Congo, the Republic of Congo, which was colonized by France. And so for me to, to, to claim nationalism, it's almost like I'm reinforcing colonialism. Mm. But my identity isn't in colonialism. And so I, I try to look beyond nations, beyond borders, because I think for me, belonging is about connections. And that's why I say I belong to everywhere, because I can go anywhere around the world and I can find connections with people, connections with culture, connections with art, with music, with, with language and tradition and storytelling. And that's where I feel like I belong. You know, when I'm amongst poets and I'm amongst writers and we have all these conversations, when people come to literary events to listen to writers speak, for me, that's incredible because I feel like in this room, there's a shared sense of belonging because we all have questions. Questions that we might not find the answer to, but we keep asking those questions because those questions is a way for us to look into the mirror of ourselves and find out who we are. You know, so I, I truly believe the sense of belonging is rooted in the, in the feeling of connections. And nowadays, more than ever, especially as a result of technology and the digital age, this question of belonging is coming up because we're so disconnected from each other because of artificial intelligence and all of that. So I, I feel like the connection is what helps us to feel like we belong. Yeah, um, can you hear me? So um, there is a word called Sangha, Sangha in India, like it's the community or the tribe, you know, that you create and you belong to. So I am really Indian and I'm, I haven't been anywhere, settled anywhere, I'm not you know, migrated anywhere. But I often grew up with this sense of not belonging, not really fitting in, even at home, you know. I never felt at home, even in my, my country, like Sumit just mentioned. Uh, my parents, they came from Bangladesh, uh, you know, and they had to leave their lands and everything behind. And I guess I got that sense and then my mother suffered, you know, she, she felt sick. So I, I really, grew, growing up, I really didn't feel I, you know, really fit in anywhere in the family or, you know, outside. And uh, then I got married and as you know, Indian women have to move to their uh, husband's house. And then again, there is a sense of uprooting. Uh, you know, the home that you have, it's, it's gone. I mean, you're in a new family. So again, that sense of not belonging kind of got, you know, solidified in a sense. And then the religion that I was born with, the conditionings and the religion I was told I belong to, I, I really didn't think, you know, with, I didn't think the rituals really interested me or, uh, you know, I'm not taking away anything from beliefs. But for me, personally, I, I didn't really have any sense of connection with what's going on there and the parties. Uh, I, I'm from Kolkata originally. We, we had the left party ruling for a long, long time. And you know what happened to them as well, you know, in the world and elsewhere. So all these ideologies, isms, and everything else, you know, I just didn't fit in anywhere growing up. And so, but I think it had its users as well, not fitting in. And then you start looking at the others, you know, you start looking at how others live and you, you're just not this little in a, in a trap almost in this prison, you know, where you're supposed to be. So, so in a way I grew and the empathy in me grew. And um, probably I started finding my tribe, my community as, you know, I grew with my peers in, in college, I'm from Kolkata, the college, the, uh, the poetic community. And uh, so the sense of not belonging, even as an Indian, is very strong. So you don't really have to migrate. So as I was telling them, and then later as I grew, I kind of stripped, I was stripped of everything, my belongings, you know. Uh, and then 
there was no sense of self and identity left and then probably I started connecting. So I, I would, uh, so it's a little spiritual route I took, uh, probably Buddhism, I, I, now I live in Pondicherry where I really feel I belong, uh, you know, to the place and, um, and after being stripped of all these belongings and then I started, you know, connecting the sense of, a larger sense of belonging, it's not restricted to even, you know, humans, it, it could be plants, animals, earth, cosmos, everything. So it, it kind of went the other way to being this isolated. And also I wanted to, you know, point out how the media, the social media and the internet, they kind of connect us to so many, but there is a growing sense of alienation in spite of that. So uh, if you all can also talk about that a bit, and you are a rap artist, so you probably connect with, you know, the young, with, through art. So, what do you think of the media and this, you know, do we, do we get a sense of belonging, um, uh, you know, with all the media and the social art? Does it have its uses, you know? A lot of activists use that as a space. Uh, well, uh, I'm a rapper and I chose rap as a medium uh, to speak about uh, how I dealt with caste, the question of caste. Uh, at a personal level as well as how I saw caste at a structural level operating. So when I started rapping about a theme that was never spoken about, there was a lot of backlash against me because, you know, you're speaking about things that discomforts people. But during those points of time, uh, the most beautiful thing that happened was, uh, of course, there was a lot of backlash, but there were also people who started writing to me from, from Kerala, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, just writing lyrics and songs saying that, you know, what you wrote about untouchability, what you wrote about, uh, you know, facing uh, edu higher educational institutional discrimination, you wrote about intercaste killings, you wrote about uh, massacres, and you wrote about uh, this, this personal alienation, and we connect to it. And through that community, I felt uh, that, you know, I find my sense of belonging, uh, I started creating a sense of belonging with uh, the people that I've never met, the people that I never know uh, about them, uh, with the idea of shared vulnerability. There's a vulnerability that we share. And that's how uh, I think when you, you're talking about it, uh, I was just reminded of, there was, there's this famous song of Tupac called Ghetto Gospel. And uh, there's, there are a few songs that always, you know, keeps coming to my mind. John R. Lucas, I'm Not Racist and Queen Latifah. So there, there were some, some of the songs that uh, I, you know, I listened to them and I felt a certain sense of uh, being shared mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. And so that's at another level. But um, apart from that, um, at a personal level, I feel that, um, you know, apart from this ar uh, artist life, because through, in this artist life, I, um, it's through shared vulnerability that I have a community. But at a personal level, I feel it's also about uh, meeting people, meeting the very few people who have had uh, similar journeys in life. Mm. Similar journeys in life, similar, you know, certain ideas about life, uh, and uh, who are accepting, you know, accepting the differences. Accepting the differences, yet, you know, ap and res uh, appreciating the similarities, and then you uh, keep moving ahead. And I think I have found few very, uh, you know, amazing people in my life, very few people, uh, where we have a lot of differences, but the similarities that we appreciate. And then we are like, okay, we are different. But uh, in this, you know, anti-social media thing that, uh, and then uh, so much of alienation happening, these few people with this idea that you can move ahead is something that really helps. Um, how do I feel about the world? Well, actually, I mean, I think, I agree absolutely with you about borders and countries. I mean, I know patriotism is a very big thing in India, um, and unfortunately, increasingly in the UK now with the Brexit thing, which I won't go into. Um, but it seems to be everywhere. People want to build walls and close off their borders and shut out the other and malign other nationalities. And I agree with Johnson that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel, basically, that it is a way of saying we are superior to other people. Our country is better than your country. And given that so much of the world has these artificial divisions that were created by colonialism, it's complete nonsense, you know. Um, 
so yeah i mean i i feel there are there are multi perspectives in the world and basically every individual has a different perspective and that's what i'm interested in and i think in my writing i really try to convey the complexity of life the multi perspectives of life that there aren't you know shashi tarur's speech about the kind of the evils of colonialism i absolutely agree with him i think many of his facts were correct but you condemn a whole race of people um which is exactly what the british did here when they were here um and it's interesting as someone who doesn't belong to either nationality completely or to either race completely i found myself listening to shashi tarur part of the british part of me felt really really guilty the indian part of me felt really outraged and i just find constantly wherever i am i've got the sense either i don't belong there or i half belong there so when i'm in india i'm half british when i'm in britain i'm half indian um and i mean there are parts of me you know there's part of me that's very rational and skeptical there's part of me that's very kind of mystical and eastern in my way of thinking and it varies from day to day and it used to be a real problem for me that i would think i need to be a proper person i need to bring these things together and decide which i now i think it's fine you know we have multi perspectives within ourselves as well and whatever empowers you one day thinking one way one day another that's fine too um so yeah i think agree belonging is a process exactly as you said and as you said you know it's about connections um and i feel actually that thing of not belonging and being split having agonized over it for years and gone to many different countries to live thinking i would find maybe the place where i belonged i realize now i will never belong anywhere and that's actually fine i mean in fact for many ways as a writer it's a really good thing because it gives you the possibility of looking from the outside at things and being able to see them in an objective way you don't have that loyalty i have divided loyalties i feel different loyalties to both britain and india but i think in the world at the moment which is so polarized and where we've got so many people with different opinions many of which are completely irreconcilable as some of my own internal experiences are that ability to hold to opposing views and not feel that you have to resolve them that you can actually live with opposing views we don't have to kill people who don't believe what we do we can actually live with them you know um because ultimately we're all human we all have the same concerns and the same feelings yeah i find it interesting because i really like traveling and meeting different kinds of people and you know different cultures and i and i tend to then belong to them you know uh, get in under their skin and see from their perspectives and you're right about uh not really wanting to kill whoever you know opposes you or disagrees with you i mean i mean then you you're getting into the same oppressor's shoes you, you know so uh but initially when 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 things go wrong and you hate everything around you you want to really <laughs> you know protest and take out you no know, sloganeering and all that but then um you kind of let it be and and let them have their say uh you know not to not protest against oppression but um you know you see humans point of view i think there is a there is a class of politicians and ordinary humans who kind of kind of want to belong and then when wanting to belong they get into these you know classes and different religions and uh so you kind of see the bigger picture in a sense and so traveling helps and meeting different cultures and expanding your world view really i think that's where my sense of belonging is strong yeah and, yeah, and yeah. For, and, yeah yeah for me too um so there's a writer called James Baldwin who says um that when you're growing up especially in your formative years as a as a teenager you you go through something you experience an emotion or a feeling almost shamefully and you think you're the only person who's going through that you know when you're a teenager and it might be in regards to sexuality it might be in regards to anything that you're experiencing right but you don't feel comfortable talking to your siblings or your parents if you have depression or something like that you think you're the only person in the world who's going through that feeling 
and then something happens, right? You might read a book. For me, it was literature. When there were certain books that I read, and that writer captured exactly what I was feeling at that time, and I hadn't spoken to anyone about it, I didn't know anyone else around me was going through it, but that writer or that artist, that musician, spoke exactly or wrote exactly what I was thinking, that gave me a sense of belonging. It gave me a sense of perspective in the world. And I think human beings, so much, we exist in a dichotomous state. A lot of the oppression and alienation and um, kind of clinging to power is about fear. And I think that fear is we are scared that we don't know where we fit in. We don't know where we come from as human beings. Because where, where, whatever identity we're born into, no, none of us chose to be born where we're born. We didn't choose the bodies that we're born in. You know, I don't think anyone who, when I was a child, I didn't know I grew up in Congo, <laughs> that I was gonna, Congo was an oppressed state. I was a child. Most of us, and we lived oblivious. And then we come to understand the world, right? We come to understand the hierarchies of the world and understand the histories of the world and how much of that is formed by colonialism and oppression. And then we try to survive as human beings because so much of our survival is based on fear and not love. See, fear is something that closes our sin and love opens us out. And I think fundamentally, the human instinct is to love, all right? But survival makes us fear. And so when we fear, we operate from a place of hatred, a place of alienation, a place of distance. But I think a way to remove that is to actually just connect with, with each other. You know, and I, I always find it fascinating when uh, especially for my poetry, when I speak to people, far, I was speaking to some students uh, the day before yesterday about my experience in Congolese politics and what that was like. And it was amazing because they were like, yeah, this is similar things that's happening here and the connections of power mm. all around the world. And I think we have to get to a stage where, as human beings, if we are as advanced as we say we are, as intellectual as we say we are, we have to get to a point where we can think beyond power, we can think beyond fear, we can think beyond hierarchy, and we can have to understand that we didn't choose. Like Tupac says, mm. I, I didn't make this world. <laughs> you know, I didn't make this world, I was born into it, you know? And we just have to like, realize that we were born into this world, but also another thing is, one day, we're all going to die. Like, that is the fundamental truth. No matter, I haven't yet met a person in the world who is immortal, you know, like, that has actually lived forever. And I don't, I don't even know if I would want to. <laughs> so, yeah. I wanted to know, uh, JJ, what's your experience in the UK? In the UK? Uh, well, so, Brexit is, I'm, I'm sure everyone here has kind of seen the shame of Brexit. Um, Brexit is... Essentially, the UK's colonial imagination trying to resuscitate itself, trying to bring itself back to life. And for me, as someone who's grown up as a refugee without papers, I've always been aware that the UK has a certain power structure. But for a lot of people, they haven't been aware that the UK operates from a place of hierarchy. I don't see how you can have an equal society when you have a king or a queen, you know? That doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. Because if we are all the same, then how can someone's blood be royal in this day and age, you know, in 2019? Like, and I look at what's happening in the UK, I look at the poverty, because there's serious poverty in the UK as well, although, the image is there's wealth and all of that, but there's a lot of poverty mm. and homelessness. And I just, I don't understand how people can live in a mansion with 50 rooms, 20 rooms, and they're all empty, but there's people outside on the street that have no, that it's snowing in London now, it's freezing conditions. There are people literally dying overnight because of the cold. And 
that shows like the politics of inhumanity that we have because we don't see each other as human beings. We see each other in terms of identity and hierarchy, whether or not someone deserves to live. You know, and that's what you were saying about like intercaste killings and all of that. Because we don't yeah. see people like ourselves. Because we wouldn't want to be killed for our identity, but it's because we're scared. We say, okay, yeah, there, it's okay over there, but not here. You know, and I think that's the politics that's happening in the UK now. It's just a repetition of the colonial mindset, which is just a false imagination. It's not rooted in reality. And somehow that has to change. You know? yeah, I just wanted to add about our people as well in India. So many of our people, I mean, they literally don't have homes. <laughs> Where do they belong, really, if you look at so many you know, in dire straits? So, Umi, if you'd like something to say. I think actually I should pass over to you because yeah, this seems much more relevant again? to you. Could you repeat that again? Sorry. Yeah. I said in India there are so many people who literally do not have homes. So, you know, people on the street, the poor, the poverty stricken, living in, you know, hand to mouth, jobless. So where do they belong? You know, where is the sense of belonging to a majority of the people in our country? You know, I, I'm just saying as a, as a view, you know, taking it away from my specific experience. I'm talking about so many others in our country. You know. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to point out uh, two incidents to, you know, to, 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 to talk about this. The first thing was, uh, I come from Orissa, southern Orissa, and uh, there's this place called Niamgiri. Niamgiri, where the Adivasis have been displaced uh, the tribal community there have been displaced over the last 10 12 years because a corporate company wanted to establish a mining company the vedanta wanted to establish a mining company another incident that i grew up uh, with was kandamal it was a riot when uh, the dalits converted to uh, the dalits converted to christianity to uh, escape the caste oppression uh, they were killed the houses were burned the churches were burned that happened in 2008 and uh, Later when I see them, I mean most of them, uh, most of their family members, some of them have gone to Chennai, some of them have gone to Mum uh, Surat, Delhi, you know, different places they have just migrated, forcefully migrated, and uh, they don't have a home to stay. So the, 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 the question of, uh, when we speak about the question of ho homelessness, I think it's a lot to also do with uh, what happens before that, what leads to all of this question. It leads to, you know, the greed of the corporates, you have this hatred for, uh, uh, this communal hatred for each other. And these, these are common people. I mean, the people who are fighting against each other, these are common people. They're just common people, but just because some politicians incited them uh, for their own benefits, they're going and killing each other. And so I think it's a lot to do with, uh, in India, I think it's uh, the hatred for communities, each other's community, and also, uh, one of the major reasons that I felt was the greed of the corporate because most of the uh, slum dwellers, if you go to Delhi or if you go to Mumbai, uh, you would find most of them are, are either from the lower caste community or from the tribal community who have been uprooted from their houses because of either land grabbing or because of corporate greed mm -hmm. or because of some kind of violence that has happened. So I think uh, to speak about homelessness, you also need to look at how things happen before all of that. Yeah, so there are walls within the country as well. Where mm. <laughs> yeah, movement of people are restricted and things like that. Uh, yeah. Would you like to say something? About, I don't feel really qualified to speak about homelessness in India. Yeah. I mean, I know there's been a lot of dam projects where people have been displaced, they've been promised compensation, they never received it. I mean, but you know, I think you probably know a great deal more about it than I do. Um, the sense of being homeless in your own, you know, country or... The sense of being homeless in your own... Well, I, I don't really have a country in that sense, you know, I don't have, you know... Um, and I don't even feel, you know, I remember as a small child sitting at the breakfast table one morning, I must have been about five or six, and just thinking, none of this is real, this is all a dream. And I've always had this feeling in life, so I don't even feel I belong on this planet in some ways, 
You know, I kind of feel like, and I, I think increasingly, probably more and more of us, as we look at what's happening in the world, are beginning to have this feeling like, is this some yeah, kind of weird when fantasy? You a, when you have a strong sense of belonging, like identity politics, you know, that can be dangerous. Yeah, you know? yeah, very. Uh, the fear based, as you, as you spoke, or fear of the other constantly. So, you know, sense of belonging can have, <laughs> mm. you know, two, two sides to it as well. So, this identity, the castes, the classes, that we have in our country, religion, and all that. So yeah, because I identities they change over mm -hmm. time, and it, everything is is essentially fluid, right? It, 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 it's a fluctuation. Um, so identities, beliefs, cultures, over time it changes. But what happens, especially as of late, like the hierarchies, the powers that be, they say, okay, this is how you are. You know, this is the, the way to be. If you are a man, a man is like this. And then you're seeing for a lot of young boys who are growing into men, they try to be a, a particular way. And then if they don't fit into that, there's like an internal crisis. You know, if you don't fit into a particular identity, there's, there's a real crisis that comes. And it's almost like it's, people feel threatened, you know. And when you feel threatened, you lash out. And that's where the... The threat, the fear comes and it becomes almost like a physical violence. And this is where we have to understand that there's a fluidity in our experiences as human beings. You know, Muhammad Ali says, if you're the same person you are at 20 years old as you are at 50 years old, you've wasted 30 years of your life, you know. And I remember even for myself, being a, how many of us have been there where we were teenagers and we were absolutely right about the world and we knew everything as teenagers and we didn't want to listen to our parents, we didn't want to listen to anyone, we just did whatever we wanted because we were 100% right about the world. And then you go and you experience and then you change and I look at myself even, you know, and I think, oh man, I was so naive. And it's like we don't have to make the mistakes for us to understand, sometimes we can learn from each other, learn from you know, the fact that things are ever changing. And I, it's, it's really beautiful to see for a lot of young people now, especially through the connections they've made on social media, they're exposed to conversations about their identity, about the fact that they can discover who they are, the fluidity in their experience, whether it's about racial identity or ethnic identity or sexuality, there's an increasing demand for that space for people to define themselves for who they are. And I think as long as people can understand that your experience is fluid, you are growing every single day as a human being, and that's okay, <laughs> you know, it's life is a journey. And that's what writing's about, I think, yeah. actually, isn't it? That's what writing is about, that we are, you know, I mean, I write historical novels, but really all historical novels are about now. Otherwise, why are they of any interest to us? They reflect the things we're worried about now. Um, and I think that's true of most, you know, most writing. Um, and that ability to, as you say, provide that different perspective that might actually save someone's life. I think we are come to an end, more or less. Uh, time's up. So any questions quickly? Anybody? Um, it's not really a question. I read a quote somewhere about belongingness and it really struck me. It says that uh, a person who considers himself as a uh, good patriot is still a tender beginner. The one who feels that the whole world is his home, he is climbing the ladder. And the one who feels that he is an alien in the world is the true master. Maybe we are all, you know, we don't belong anyway. None of us belong here. This is a short visit here. In that time, we just live, learn to live with each other as well as we can. Mm -hmm. Very good. <laughs> so, this is a question to Ubi Sinha. Uh, actually, uh, the narratives on exile uh, in a mainstream uh, discourse always appears from a male perspective. So, uh, a woman being in exile uh, is a process of double marginalization. Uh, so, what's your experience of being a woman in exile or a woman homelessness? Uh, the narrative of a woman homelessness, can you 
speak uh, more about that. Sorry, I didn't quite catch a woman. Homelessness. 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 A, a, a woman being in exile is, a, uh, is uh, entirely different from a man being in exile. Do you feel any uh, different, uh, do you feel it's a different voice, the voice of a woman being in exile? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't anymore, as if you're asking me personally. Um, I think when I was young, I did, because I think, well, we know from the Me Too movement what the world was like, some, you know, still like, actually, largely, but certainly when I was young in the 70s, um, it was quite routine for women to be sexually harassed, to have people put their hand up your skirt to, you know, and it, you were supposed to take it in good part, it was all just a joke. Um, certainly, if you'd gone to the police and reported it, um, they would have laughed at you. So I think for a woman, that vulnerability is always there. And I mean, I have male friends who travel in the world, you know, you can go alone and travel in India, I know women who've done it too, but I personally would always have been too worried to do that because, I mean, just the kind of hassle as a young woman of sitting down in a cafe and some guy comes to talk to you and then you've got that negotiation between you've been taught to be very polite and very obedient and, you know, in, in the case of women growing up in India, you don't want to be rude to someone, but you know that they're manipulating you and that they're trying to kind of manipulate you into some kind of uncomfortable sexual situation, but you don't feel that you can just tell them, basically, to get lost. Um, and I'm not sure men struggle with those same things in those ways. So I think, yes, for a woman to be homeless, I mean, if I see a homeless woman on the pavement in, in England, I'm much, much more concerned. And obviously, you're concerned for everybody but I'm much more concerned for her because I think of, you know, the things that could happen to her. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question in terms of homelessness, but I think, yes, there is a kind of, I think we're all aware that women are more vulnerable in some ways. Uh, uh, before asking my question, uh, I don't believe in this, uh, we are here for this short time period and all this, uh, because uh, that will eventually le lead to uh, vegetarianism and killing is uh, harmful. Anyway, we kill, we haven't even uh, found out what it is. Anyway, we kill thousands of ants when we walk. We kill thousands of life. So that's just another part of uh, human thinking only. We, we kill always, we always kill when we walk. We kill mosquitoes and we kill a lot of life, okay. So the, my question is to Sumit Samos. Uh, see, uh, you talked about Shashi Tharoor. Mm, Shashi Tharoor and, uh, no, uh, um, uh, Ma'am, you talked about Shashi Tharoor speaking about the darkness uh, that the darkness that uh, uh, colonialism uh, felt, the colonialism did to India. But uh, this people like Shashi Tharoor, why people like Shashi Tharoor will obviously uh, speak about the atrocities that uh, colonialists did to India without speaking about the real issue, the real issue about. Uh, Delhi uh, atrocities, what caste does to India. They will never address this issue in international media, the, wherever uh, they get an opportunity. So how, uh, how as a Delhi rapper, you are going to uh, face this obstacle, uh, that face this uh, obstacle of presenting it in, 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 ten, in uh, presenting this issue in international media uh, along, with this, uh, along with your rap? And how, uh, like, what kind of uh, international uh, friendships and international international stages you get, and how do you use that? Well, uh, I think uh, if I'm not wrong, you you are referring to Era of Darkness by Sasitharu, right? I think Sasitharu should have written another book before that, you know, talking about uh, how how caste operated in India. Before colonialism, caste, caste was always continuing, even now it continues. Uh, so I think Sashitharu would have written about that, that would have been better because he always goes on bashing the Britishers, but he never talks about how caste operates in India. He, I wish Sashitharu should write about Nangeli of Kerala. Sashitharu should write about Ayankali. Sashitharu should maybe write about uh, how the, you know, how the Mahars, the Dalits were treated during the Peshwa rule. You know, pot on their neck, brooms on their back. Even the shadows were uh, untouchable. 
there are people who are untouchable and there are also people who are unseeable during those times. I think Sashitharu should have written more about that. And uh, about getting international stages, yeah. Uh, last year I got opportunities to go to France and Mauritius where um, I wanted to, you know, they gave me an opportunity to speak about um, the Antikas discourse through rap. And uh, after I spoke, most of them uh, came up to me and they said, okay, we have never heard this, what you speak, you know, what you're trying to speak about, we have never heard about this. Then I said, okay, maybe you should give more opportunities to Dalit guys like us, so that we'll be speaking about caste and uh, the deep-rooted atrocities that are, that are happening within the country. Yeah. Morning. My question is to Samos. Do you believe that conversion can make any change in caste oppression? I think in the, even in history, like Ambedkar, and Periyar Ramasamanayaka, uh, he asked to uh, ask the mass crowd to convert into another religion. From your personal experience, can you say about the conversion and uh, what change it make in your life? Uh, well, uh, the different pers do you know the different aspects of when you convert? Uh, I think uh, when, uh, like if you, today if you see, the socio-economic indicators of the converts, the Buddhist Dalits and the Dalit Christians fare far better than the Dalits who are Hindu and the Dalits who are Muslims now. And that has something to do with some kind of a change. Maybe uh, I, when I was a Dalit, like uh, when you know I was a Hindu, then my parents converted to Christianity at a point of time and I got education in a mission boarding school. And due to that I'm sitting here now. Uh, but that does not mean that, you know, I'm completely uncritical about Christian theology. I'm completely uncritical about Buddhist theology. Because at the end of the day, my life was about getting education and someone gave me, I got it. So the morality cannot be applied to me. If the Hindus would have given me uh, education, I would have gone there. The Christian gave me, I went there. The Buddhists gave some to Maharashtra, they went there. So it's all about survival. So when, the, when it is the question of survival, I don't think the question of morality can be applied. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, this is again to Sumit. Okay. I was just Googling to, uh, your uh, credentials in Google and uh, real proud, really proud about that. Uh, congratulations for you. That. Thank you. What I feel is that the legs uh, or the depressed itself is an inflection point just like what the blacks had in the 60s and 70s in the US. We have, uh, present day we have leaders like Jignesh Mevani, people like Paranji, there are so many people. So what's your take on that? Uh, how, the, how the youngsters should go going forward to have an equal status in the, in the, in the macro level in India? Um, I think simply to put it in two, three lines, we have to build a lot of autonomous institutions for ourselves. Uh, you know, we have to like, uh, what some of our friends have been doing is, you know, in the slums, in the Dalit slums, they have been running resource center to tell the Dalit youths about, uh, you know, what are the opportunities in higher education, the study materials, small, small thing. Paranjit is doing something in the, uh, in the cinema field. I'm trying to do something in the hip-hop field, you know. Through that, I'm trying to take the message through. The people who are better at writing should do it. So whatever maybe your means, you know, maybe painting, uh, hip-hop, dance, uh, movie, documentary, whatever happens, I think uh, all of these mediums can be uh, forms of activism. And I strongly believe in building autonomous institutions. We have to have our own media, we have to have, at, at a point of time, our own schools, which Malcolm X, you know, at a point of time, thought about, thought for the blacks. We have to have that, backups. Because many a times, like me, I studied in JNU, I, my degree was uh, withheld for one year, and I didn't have lawyers around me. If at that point of time, if there were a group of lawyers, Dalit lawyers, who would have a collective, I would have gone to them because I was in problem. So I think we have to build autonomous groups and collectives in every field. Hi. Uh, so I, uh, I believe... That, is, can I just ask, is there, are there any women who want to ask a question? Yeah. Yes, we need equal participation from men and women, so... Sorry? Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Go, Go ahead. Uh, I believe uh, identity, is the identity is the thing which controls our intellect and pile up, helps in piling up the memories. So uh, in, the, in the Vedic, uh, Vedic India, uh, 
we had a concept called Aham Brahmasmi, which means I am the universe. So, uh, uh, if, we, if we have a limited identity based on religion, caste, and gender, uh, and if we, if we relinquish that particular identity and, have, and acquire uh, identity of the universe, I am the universe, then we can uh, destroy the walls we are trying to build up based on this narrow-minded identity. What do you think about that? It's, it's to me. Well, uh, I don't want to be a Dalit, but people make me Dalit. Because they are, they are caste discrimination against me, that's why I'm Dalit. The day caste discrimination stops, the day all the violence stops, I would cease to be a Dalit, I would, cease to, I would be a human. Till the point, the, uh, what Dalit means is to be broken, to be exploited, to be crushed. So till the point of time, when I'm being crushed, when I'm being exploited, when I'm being uh, stigmatized in everyday life, till that point of time I would call myself Dalit, because that is my experience which is specific to me. It's not specific to uh, the higher caste and higher class elites of the country. It's only specific to me. So due to my specificities, I have a specific identity. And the day all of this stops, Maybe I would call myself human, I would no more call myself Dalit. I write poems and I, you know, when I really feel bad and I write something down, maybe it's a journal, maybe it's a poem, I feel like my identity is being more revealed to me and that brings me more peace. So is it the same it, you know, have you all uh, experienced that? Do you think writing can help to, in our search for identity in the polarized world? I think, yes. I, I think you should read your poem. Well, you, I, no, you answer, you answer. I think that's a very... Okay. Yeah. Um, so the gist of it was, what, does writing help you to feel more your identity, to kind of come into your own identity? Yes, I think it does. I mean, I think... Um, I find if I don't write, because I'm very lazy, um, and I find it quite hard to make myself get down to things, but I find when I'm not writing, if I leave it for a certain period of time, I start to get very frustrated and angry and irritable, and I start to forget who I am, really. I think so. For me, there's something about writing and putting my life out on the page. I, I write bits of memoir from time to time, too, and I found it a really good way. There's a way in which there are parts of my life which used to be very distressing to remember that I, having written them out, I can now look at them as a kind of story that is outside me. I can impose my own interpretations on it. And you can kind of creatively interact with reality in a way that make, makes it make sense to you and makes it meaningful rather than just these awful random things that happen to people. And I think that is a really powerful thing to be able to do. And I don't think you need to be a writer who wants to be published. I think people can write for themselves. I think it's a really worthwhile thing to do to write for them. I'm actually a creative writing tutor. Something I say to my students, you don't have to want to be published. You can just write for yourself. And it's a tremendously therapeutic and rich and fulfilling thing to do.